Here we go. <clears throat> I guess we are. Hey, good evening, everybody. And I'll wait, for the, I'll wait for the confirmation from the guys. I got you on Facebook. Hello. 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 <laughs> Paul, what was that hat? C-H for Christmas? It said C-H for Christmas. <laughs> I've even got the mug to match. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's red anyway. Yeah. <laughs> The mug to man. I like it. Like it. Like it. Mug, man. <laughs> Joe Biden would say it's the matching mug, man. <laughs> <coughs> well, good evening, everybody, and welcome back to the page. It's uh, uh, the our Sunday night offering of astronomy outreach, the Sunday night astronomy show and comedy show. Uh, <laughs> first of all, I'd like to welcome back uh, Royal Astronomical Society of Canada NB chapter member Paul Owen from the Moonshadow Observatory in Hampton. Hey, Paul. Hey, I'm smarty guy. <laughs> and uh, RASP NB member Mike Powell from the PFO Observatory here in St. John. Welcome, Mike. <laughs> Evening, everybody. Give it an ear flap. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so obviously the the hats and things are are indicating the fact that we've got a, a little bit of a Christmas show coming up. We got another full show planned for you tonight. We're going to start off with our what's up in space uh, segment, um, and then we're our regular gearbox talk that we're into now is going to be expanded this week and the next few weeks uh, as we uh, help you make decisions on what uh, you might be considering for Christmas for your stargazer on your list. Uh, we'll take you uh, take all your questions too on telescopes, binoculars, stargazing, books and more and show you some of the things that we think are some of the more practical gifts for you. Uh, we'll also take a look at uh, what's up in space this week. Paul's going to return with our another segment of our interesting uh, Rosanna's Fun Facts uh, segment. And we'll also have a wonderful photo submissions. Well, I guess we don't have any photo submissions this week. Sorry. None no. come in. None come in this week. So we got to get that changed. I think once we start our <laughs> next moon contest, that'll that'll change. We just have pictures of space between stars. There, yeah. That black space between the stars. <laughs> <laughs> like, that dark, <laughs> like that blank space between my ears that some people say. <laughs> <laughs> So sit back and enjoy, folks, and remember, this is a family-friendly live broadcast, so if you have any questions about the night sky, uh, or e actually um, questions about uh, gifts for stargazers, that's what our, our focus is tonight, uh, we're happy to try to answer them here for you. <laughs> uh, so let's get started, I guess, with a brief view of what's new in space this week. So let's see how we got it here. Hey, hello, hello Lisa, Mark, uh, Chris, do you have a head cold? <laughs> Well, I might have, with this hat gets too a little bit tighter. <laughs> His head's not cold. Uh, ease, nice hats. Uh, hey, star friends, perfect. Okay, everybody. Uh, let's get started with our what's new in space, I guess. First of all, uh, give me a second. I'm going to try to share my screen. And present now. Fire screen. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's take this off to full screen. All righty, let's see what we got. What's going on this week in space? Let's make sure you can see this first of all, I guess. <clears throat> Photos up. That's a big turkey dinner dish. That is. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. Okay, so NASA hailed its Voyager 2 probe in interstellar space for the first time in more than seven months. Uh, Voyager 2's handlers beamed a set of test commands to the spacecraft on Thursday, October 29th, using the Deep Space Station 43, or DSS-43, radio antenna in Canberra, Australia. Voyager 2 confirmed that it registered the instructions and executed them without incident. Now, this thing's 20 billion kilometers away, and they sent a message to it. And it accepted the message. Um, NASA said uh, officials uh, said in an update on Monday the commands uh, were 
the first NASA had relayed to the Voyager 2 spacecraft since mid-March when the 230-foot wide or 70-meter DSS-43 went offline for repairs and upgrades. This dish has actually been upsized twice to be able to pick up the feeble signal from Voyager. This ongoing maintenance work is extensive, involving, other, among other things, the addition of two new radio transmitters, including one that uh, is used to communicate with Voyager 2. I've got to find my mouse here. Here we go. Uh, that particular transmitter hadn't been replaced in more than 47 years. Now, the Deep Space Network is a uh, series of radio dishes in three different, roughly equidistant locales. Canberra, uh, Australia, Madrid, Spain, and Goldstone, California, that NASA uses to communicate with its far-flung spacecraft. The Canberra site includes three smaller dishes that together uh, can receive spacecraft relays, so the Voyager 2 team has been able to keep tabs on the distant probe, even while the DSS-43 work prevented it from sending commands to it. And Voyager 2 cannot be hailed using DSN gear in Spain or California. That's because the spacecraft is moving downward relative to the Earth's orbital plane and can be reached only from the southern hemisphere. Now, Voyager 2 and its twin, Voyager 1, launched a few weeks apart in 1977 to conduct an epic grand tour of the solar system's giant planets. The two probes accomplished this unprecedented task. Voyager 1 flew by Jupiter and Saturn, and Voyager 2 had close encounters with Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And the Neptune flyby, which included an up-close look at the planet's largest moon, Triton, is what Voyager, uh, is, that's what sent Voyager heading south, by the way. And the Voyagers kept on flying. Oops, we're way past. I don't want to be that far ahead. How'd I get that one in there? He's, he's in the wrong spot. I'll keep going by him. Here we go. And then Voyagers kept on flying. Voyager 1 entered interstellar space in August 2012, becoming the first human-made object ever to do so. Now, Voyager 2 followed suit in late 2018. Uh, both spacecraft are still going strong, giving scientists their first up-close looks at the interstellar medium, the huge expanse of deep space beyond the sun's sphere of influence. Now, the nuclear-powered Voyagers are running low on juice, however, so mission team members have turned off several instruments on the probes over the past few years to uh, maximize their operational lives. Both spacecraft should have enough power to keep gathering data through 2024, and they keep trying to uh, expand that with new programming. Now, Voyager 1 is currently about, uh, oops, too far again, sorry. Here's my, there we go. Okay, yeah, Voyager 1, sorry, is currently about 22.7 billion kilometers from Earth, and Voyager 2 is about 18.8 .8 billion kilometers from us. It therefore takes a command from Mission Control about 21 hours to get to Voyager 1 and about 17 and a half hours to reach Voyager 2. So just one second, I want to bring up something else here. Hopefully it's going to work. And I want to bring the screen over just for a second over the top of this one and show you here's the website, uh, NASA's website, Voyager spacecraft. So what I want to do really is show you the speed. Watch this speed down here on both of these numbers. You can see Voyager 1 distance from Earth in kilometers and the distance from the sun. Look at how quickly it's changing. Wow. <laughs> that's just Voyager 1. So it's 22.6 billion kilometers away from Earth right now, or 151 times the distance from us to the sun. And sometimes these numbers will go backwards, just depending on, uh, depending on where we are in relation to uh, going around the sun. Uh, the one-way light time, so it takes 21 hours, 1 minute, and 37 seconds to get a message to it at the speed of light. And Voyager 2 is there. There's the speed of Voyager 2. You can see how quickly the kilometers are changing. Could you imagine that going that quickly? Oh. So, really interesting site. If you want to go visit it, it's voyager.jpl.nasa.gov. Gives you all the information about the Voyagers themselves. Talks about the golden record that they that they had attached to them to uh, tell uh, other civilizations that were here, that kind of thing. Which is probably probably not a good thing, depending on how advanced they are. But we did it anyway. Too late now. Too late. Yep. <laughs> okay. So next up, the International Space Station is celebrating a significant milestone as the orbiting lab reaches its 20th anniversary of continuous human presence. On November the 2nd, 2000, 
the uh, Expedition Crew uh, 1 arrived at the ISS. NASA astronaut William Shepard was the space station's first commander, paving the way for 20 years of humans living and working in low Earth orbit. Now, since that historic mission, the orbiting lab has been continually occupied by humans. Now, more than 240 voyagers from 19 countries have visited the largest st structure ever built in space. With a mass of more than 400 tons, the modular structure, with solar panels extended, covers an area about the size of a football field, offering an interior living space equal to about a, the uh, a Boeing 47, or 747 jumbo jet. While thousands of science experiments have been conducted in a unique environment, the space station uh, project hasn't been without criticism. Compared to the incredible developments um, of the 1960s that landed humans on the moon in less than a decade, the space station seemed to uh, pause in human exploration because all activities were confined to low Earth orbit. Some ex space exploration advocates, such as engineer Robert Zubrin, founder of the Mars Society, felt we should be heading on straight onto Mars instead. While the space station didn't take humans to other worlds, it did show what was required to get there and how to live and work in space for long periods of time. Now, research on some of the astronauts who made long-duration stays on station found changes in the immune system, even vision problems. Uh, the astronauts also learned to get along in a confined space, how to tolerate separation from friends and family, how to grow food and repair equipment, all the skills that would be needed on a journey to Mars and back. Now, look at that view. Could you imagine just sitting there and looking at that all day? It's amazing. That's that's from the cupola, they call it. It's a cupola, or C-U-P-O-L-A. It's a small piece that hangs on the bottom of the state station with all these windows around it, and they can go in there and take high-definition shots of the Earth, but just to go in there and relax as well. A lot of astronauts spend their time in there, apparently. And I, I would, too, for sure. <laughs> Um, so NASA is focused uh, on returning to the moon by 2024 with the Artemis program. The key to that project is a new space station to be placed in orbit around the moon called Gateway. It too will be an international project uh, with collaboration from Canada, Europe and Japan. And NASA's somewhat ambitious and possibly unrealistic plan is that the first parts of the station will launch by 2024. And finally, Conspiracy theorist and alien hunter Squat Waring is at it again and is now insisting that he has found evidence of a UFO crash landing site on Mars. <laughs> um, Mr. Waring said that in, on his blog, uh, UFO sightings daily, while, research, uh, while searching through some NASA archives, I came across a Mars photo with a crashed disc in it. Yes, that's what it looks like. Uh, the craft I found has a thin disc edge rising up to a black, a thick inner area and an upper hump that is not curved but made with straight lines. I can even see windows in the Mars craft that I found. This is inexplicable proof that aliens on Mars had spacecraft. So he's not saying they're there today, he's just saying that they were, I guess. However, the object in question is quite obviously a rock which resembles a manufactured structure. Now the brain is wired to see familiar patterns such as faces, for example, when they are not actually there, and this applies to the rock in question. Now, this psychological phenomenon is known as peri periodolia. Peri uh, <laughs> periodolia. <laughs> uh, anyway, NASA says periodolia is the psychological phenomenon where people see recognizable shapes in clouds, rock formations, or other unrelated objects or data. There are many examples of this phenomenon here on Earth and in space. Now, however, Mr. Waring said that the coronavirus pandemic has proven that humanity has the strength to deal with an alien revelation and NASA should release any evidence it has. He said much like COVID-19 did to the people in each country as it spread, because the public once believed that such a pandemic would be impossible, and yet the human race has changed their perspective on that very uh, subject. Now that's how disclosure of intelligent aliens would be, but it would not kill people or frighten them as much. However, Waring's claims are not backed up by any scientific evidence. Space scientists and astronomers have not found yet any traces or clues that there is or ever was life on Mars. And the Sega continues. <laughs> and that's what's new in space this week. Oh, great. Hey. <laughs> wow. We're back. <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievable, huh? Well, we got to keep digging, right? 
I mean, who's to say? I want to call him. Um, uh, okay, what else have we got here? <clears throat> okay, so we've got some comments here. So I'm trying to go through the comments. Uh, that should be very fast. Mark says, I did the virtual open house for the VLA yesterday. Wonder how far they can hear you. That is uh, a good question, Mark. Question mark. Question mark. No. Question mark. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that is a good question, Mark. <laughs> See, I did not know that. I did not know that. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Yeah. I wonder how far they can I can hear from me. It's, it is a, a good question. Comma, Mark. <laughs> you know something? Um, in Rosanna's talk tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about sound. Oh, perfect. So, so stay, stay tuned. Question mark. I did not know that. Okay. Yeah, question mark. Yeah. Uh, so Mike went to bars to get the alien in his astronomy room. Mike, let's give us a little picture of uh, what's going on behind you there. Well, let me see. Be in winter time, young fellows. Here, get some. They got all the winter toques on anyway. I'm ready to <laughs> <off>. <laughs> yeah, the the, the one that's closest to you looks like the alien Grinch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. There's, uh, there's Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, folks, uh, let's get back to some seriousness. We can't do that, I don't think, anyway. It doesn't matter. No. Uh, so we're going to suggest a few things that we are thinking about for Christmas ideas for the stargazers out there. So who would like to take off with the first uh, item, guys? That means one of you. Go ahead, Mike. Well, I got two items that I want to quickly show. Christmas is coming. You know, astronomers start getting their little fingers going and making hints to the wives and kids. And you never get what you ask for, but you always got to put the hints out there, right? So... I come down with an idea and said, you know something, let me give hints for astronomy stuff, but it's not a telescope related. And maybe, a, maybe, you know, if I can say it's dual purpose, I can get it. So last year I put out the hints and sure enough, uh, they came through. It worked. I said, you know something, we can use these for uh, not just astronomy, but I can use them for something else. And the first one I want to show is these night sky constellation playing cards. And what they are, it's a deck of 52 cards. Really, really nice. Oh, let me get in front of the camera here. It even, hey, it even looks like I get the words right. And each <laughs> one has a constellation on it. And it marks the constellation. I didn't know there was 52 constellations, but there's also two jokers in the back. So, But if you want to learn the constellations, there's the one way to do it. You go, hey, the four diamonds is now... Whatever that is. <laughs> Monteros. And so on. And so it's really cool. The other neat part that I found about these cards, we'll get away from the two jokers, is if I can get it in light. Uh, let me get a light on here. He's talking about us, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Hearts. Jokers. laughs> I don't know if we can read here, but hearts, all the hearts are the spring constellations. Oh. oh. Then you get into the spades, and uh, you're going to love this, Chris. The ace of spades. That, oh, is no, no, no. Uh, <laughs> uh, right. And it's the summer <laughs> constellation. <laughs> uh, yeah, great. The number one thing in that deck is. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, so, I'd have 51 cards. That'd be it. We need to get into clubs. Clubs is the fall constellations. Awesome. Like Pegasus. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The great square. And then you get into diamonds. And diamonds is the winter constellations. And everybody knows this one. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, yes. So it, uh, it shows you the mythological figure down here at the bottom with the constellations spread out. It shows you the actual constellation itself. That's Cygnus. And that tells you what time of year it's good to see it. It's spring, summer, winter, or fall. Is that Cygnus, that one? <laughs> that signals for Ryan's. The cool part is you can play poker, you can play hearts, you can play whatever you want because it's a normal deck of cards. And as you're playing cards, you can learn the constellations. Awesome. So 
Oh. I just today bought two packs for myself uh, because uh, I got some Christmas gifts coming to, to send out. And I wanted to have these in, in the uh, stocking, so to speak. And they were uh, eight bucks shipped to my door off Amazon. Now, I noticed the price went up from yesterday. So if you're looking to buy space cards for your kids, especially on Amazon or a friend or a family member, buy them now because I'll guarantee you the closer we get to Christmas, the higher the price is going to get. Absolutely. Yeah. They'll blame it on COVID any way they can. But I thought, isn't that the coolest thing to get for someone as a stocking gift? It's astronomy related and you get to learn with it as well at the same time. That's awesome. So, they're the it, it's the greatest thing since sliced bread, as I said. <laughs> yeah, I like it. Great gift. That's one. The other one is. Oh, we'll it's, pause. It's, we'll we'll give pause? you a, we'll give you a break. We'll get Paul yeah. to go with one. Pause. <laughs> <laughs> That's just eerie. That's just eerie. <laughs> All right, Paul, you show one of yours, and then I'll show one of mine. <laughs> <laughs> Yours, I'll show mine. <laughs> All right. We're going down how fast here. <laughs> All right. So if you want, if can you can you pin me? You're pinned. Am I pinned? Good. Consider yourself pinned. Yep. Rin pin ten. I'm pinned. Okay. So what I'm going to show <clears throat> is a really really great book, and this book is put out by uh, National Geographic, and it's forwarded by um, by Chris Hadfield. And it's called Visual Galaxy. And I'm just going to read you the little uh, forward on the back because it really explains what this book is. And then I'll show you some stuff on the inside and where to get it and all that stuff. So, so it says, uh, this visual wellspring of the cosmos is the perfect companion for every stargazer. Filled with page after page of magnificent photographs. And by the way, the photographs are all from uh, places like uh, the Hubble and anything that's professional around the world. Uh, filled with page after page of magnificent photographs, this book offers a deep dive into the past, present, and future of our home galaxy, the Milky Way. Embark on this dramatic journey by witnessing the stunning birth, life, and death of stars, including the story of our own sun and the solar system and all it contains. Continue on to discover our galaxy with the known universe with a scintillating peak at exoplanets, the new frontier in search for life. Detailed maps and absorbing imagery and recent space missions illuminate the latest scientific information um, complemented by a forward by celebrated astronaut Chris Hadfield. And, uh, and because it's put out by National Geographic, it is an extremely well put together book. And the photographs in there, like I was saying, they're amazing. And it gets into every possible thing you can think of. So for the amateur or somebody just getting into um, Stargazing, uh, it'll tell you everything about the formation of the galaxy, our part, the arm we're in, uh, the sun, how it forms, stars, how they form, uh, gets into exoplanets, gets into uh, all the, the planets in the solar system, and, and it's just a wealth of, of great knowledge. I was excited to buy this book. It was a little expensive when it first came out, and it's still expensive. It uh, The retail price on it is uh, $66 Canadian. But... Um, I did a little research, and I found out, first of all, you can buy it through um, Indigo uh, or Chapters, and you can get it uh, online. You can't go in the store and buy it. you got to buy it online for $49.30. I looked a little deeper in it again, and you can buy it from a place called uh, The Book Outlet for $22.60. So um, a fantastic book for somebody who is – uh, just learning astronomy, and also for someone who's very well uh, um, versed in astronomy, because it's full of ex extremely good information, uh, you know, that you can share with, and, and it's a very thick book. Again, it's a hardcover, put up by National Geographic. It's fantastic. So that's the one that I would recommend for a great uh, astronomy book for someone for Christmas. Awesome. Thanks, Paul. Uh, yeah. That worked great. Do so they have a blue ray what, huh? Do they have a Blu-ray version? Because I don't read. <laughs> <laughs> they, they send a guy to your house to show you the pictures. Ah, that's what it yeah, is. Yeah. Actually, Ann Ramey, for those who are old like us, will come to your house. Oh. And she'll sit there on a chair and she'll walk through like you would uh, a children's I, book. I did awesome. not know that. 
<laughs> okay, yeah, she's see you next week in the romper room. Oh, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be looking forward to inviting her. Um, okay, my little deal is going to be, uh, or one of the two, I guess. We're all going to take a couple of things tonight. Uh, but we'll do our first three. Then Paul's going to pause. Maybe, Paul, you can do your Rosanna's fun facts after my talk. And uh, yeah. then we'll go right back and do more ideas for Christmas. So I've got this one uh, that I wanted to show. I'll pin myself here, maybe. And what I've got is the Celestron NextWise It adapter. Actually, I didn't want to pin myself yet because I, Paul, I want you to bring up the one that you have oh, there, okay. Paul, first, I guess. Okay. So, do, you, do you want to talk about that one first, and I'll just show yeah. you what, what it comes to me? Okay, yeah. so uh, people know that I do a lot of live feeds, and I use my cell phone camera probably more than I use my DSLR, and uh, it's, I guess, it's quicker uh, when I'm taking a quick shot of something in the sky or when I'm doing a live feed on Facebook or uh, YouTube or Instagram now. Um, I'll try to attach my phone to my eyepiece, and there are several ways to do that. Uh, and this one here is probably one of the better ones that I've ex discovered. I've, I bought pretty well all types that are out there. I must have probably 10 of them around here somewhere. But I've, I keep going back to this one. And it's called the Celestron NextYZ Adapter. Um, let me bring it up then, I guess. Okay, so that's the box. And I've already got it out of the box, but that's how the phone sits inside the, uh, the holder. I've got the device here. So a lot of people have already seen this, I know, um, but I'm bringing it up because it is a nice, a nice Christmas gift uh, mm -hmm. for the cigar gazer. So what happens here is that you put your eyepiece here. This is the clamp. The clamp does adjust, so your uh, adapter sits onto your eyepiece this way. Uh, maybe I can demonstrate back here. Get this out of the way. No, I don't have an eyepiece in this one. Anyway, there's a telescope. It would mount onto the side like this, right onto the eyepiece. It clamps down tight uh, with this little thumb knob down here. It's, it'll accept uh, two-inch eyepieces, certain two-inch eyepieces, not all. Uh, the big fat ones that I have, the uh, Celestron uh, LXs, it won't clamp around them, but it'll fit around most uh, two-inch eyepieces. So it does open up quite a ways. But the ideal thing about this one is that it adjusts in three directions. So you've got your X, Y. You've got your uh, Y axis that way and your x-axis that way, and then your z-axis the opposite way. So you can adjust in three directions uh, for, for your uh, phone, for the different types of phones. So my phone is the, is the uh, Huawei P30 Pro, and it just clamps in the device like this. And all I have to do then is just line up the camera with the eyepiece. So it's pretty simple to use. And it works uh, very well. Uh, the only thing I find about this is that if you get a really heavy phone, it does tend to weigh down a little bit. So you've got to be careful that you don't have something uh, hanging out too far on it. But saying that, uh, there is a guy that uh, had fixed that one. I'm going to take it out of the clamp here. There is a guy that had fixed that by hanging a small weight off of one. Um, but also, you can't really see them here. Uh, maybe you can. Way up in the very top corner there. A little hard to see, but there are some screws right there. And those screws can tighten in. So if it starts to get slack after a while, you can take those screws and tighten the tension up on on the device. So great little device. Uh, great for binoculars as well. Works well for them. Um, any style telescope, you want to set your phone in and take a, a nice uh, photo. Um, one thing I was going to suggest to them is that I use mine, again, on a live feed, and I'm outside in the cold a fair amount when I'm offering a live feed. So I didn't have an idea, uh, a way to connect my phone to a charger while I was offering a live feed. So I drilled a small hole in the bottom of it, and now I can feed my cord through and plug my phone in. So that's something I'm going to try to suggest to Celestron, that they, that they come with a small hole in the bottom of them so you can plug your phone in. Uh, if you're out there taking a long exposure or you're taking a long shot of the moon or whatever, or offering a live feed like I do. So... Uh, I really like this one. Uh, there are other options like uh, the iOptron one, which I had tried for a number of years. And uh, that's this one here, the iOptron. And what they do, though, is they come with a, a standard eyepiece, so a 13 millimeter eyepiece. And it threads onto this small piece here, like so. Nope, oh, not like that. Like this. 
and when it does it can adjust this way so I can set my phone in to the holder and there's a thumb screw on the back and it opens it up well normally won't do it right now will it <laughs> of course not there it goes there it goes there's open okay so I can set my phone in adjust it back to the location turn it around set my camera uh, um, lens in the right location and then I've got a, a standard uh, size uh, image in my in my camera now I can zoom in and out of course on my camera lens itself with digital zoom but it is a nice it's, it moves very easily if you want to uh, to set up anybody's phone so I do a lot of outreach of course and uh, I have people come by that want to take a photo of the moon not as much outreach lately of course but when they want to come by and take a photo of the moon I, I'll use this one very quickly I can adjust it very very easily and uh, set it in the eyepiece and away you go so that one there is about 35 bucks um, by Optron. Actually, no, they're up to they're up to sixty bucks now. <laughs> but the Celestron Next YZ one that I showed there is actually available on at Canadian Tire right now for fifty nine ninety nine. So I got <coughs> that one, and I think I can bring that one up in a second here. I have to share my screen to do it, maybe. Uh, so. I suppose you can't see, you guys might not be able to see that, but I know the audience can see because I'm seeing what's being broadcast out right now. So it's, uh, it's uh, Canadian Tire locally has it on for $59.99. Not, not in stock in Rossi right now, but there's one in stock in Fairville Boulevard. So if you want to run over there quickly, there's one in Fredericton, uh, one in Moncton. Uh, and that's, uh, I mean, that's local. And again, um, you can go to actually Ivan's Camera in Moncton, which is another local shop. Uh, he has them. Uh, you can try uh, a Lear of the Nature or Astronomy Plus in Montreal. There's lots of telescope stores in Canada, and I try to encourage that people buy from telescope stores rather than uh, um, Amazon all the time, simply because we want to support our businesses because if we don't support our telescope dealers, they're not going to be around very much longer, So, uh, and especially in times like this, right, with COVID. So uh, keep an eye on your local suppliers for sure. Um, local artists as well. Uh, if you're looking at buying objects uh, locally, consider local artists uh, because they need our money too, more than Amazon does. Did you want to see the other one? I did want to did there. I did want to show that one too, Paul. Yes. Yeah, so that's that's the uh, that's the one that's similar to Celestron. Okay. So what this is, this is sort of the next YZ before next YZ. So this is sort of the original thing. It's just it's bigger and bulkier. It is made out of metal, so it's, it's actually built quite well. And it was designed to do two things. You could use, you could put on the girly, those little small camcorders. You could mount that on it, uh, which nobody uses anymore because your phone does all the video now. And, and of course, your um, you can mount your cell phone on it because you can buy little adapters that um, that will thread in just like um, like the bottom of a um, tripod. Or of course, your DSLR camera. You don't want to take some pictures of the moon or things like that. And basically what it does, the same thing that Chris said, except it's bigger and bulkier. The eyepiece would fit right in here. Your camera would mount on this plate. So the, 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 the bottom of your camera would mount there. And then you can, with these buttons, you can actually have your camera move back and forth. This plate will move side to side. And then this long arm here with this will allow you to move this plate up and down. So you've got all three axes covered with it. Uh, again, it's it's pretty it's a little bit bulkier and bigger, but it's just a bigger version of what um, what Chris had. And I'm not even sure if these are are still available mm -hmm. because with the next YZ that kind of takes place of this, and the next YZ is about half the size of this. Right. And there's more plastic on the next YZ, so it's lighter than this. So um, the next YZs really come a long ways than what these are there's still probably a few shops that have still got these in their shelves somewhere mm. um and they're probably to be frank uh probably right around the same price as an xyz anyway yeah but just to give you an idea how far the next yz's come along right okay great paul thanks so that that was uh, idea number uh three i guess yeah <laughs> trey <laughs> trey <laughs> idea number trey under so, trey yeah so again <laughs> Fifty nine ninety nine at Canadian Tire. I've seen them at uh, Astronomy Plus in Montreal for right around the same price. Ivan's camera, I believe, in Moncton has them for sixty bucks. 
Um, yep. You got to consider too, uh, if they're cheaper at a farther location, you might have to pay for shipping uh, sometimes, but sometimes they'll give you a deal on that as well. They'll throw in the mail for you for a couple of bucks. So. For local people too, um, there's a place called Harvey Studio in Fredericton and they're a camera place, but they do sell um, Celestron telescopes and accessories. So okay. you should be able to get that too. Great, thanks, and if Paul. it doesn't work, you check out Owen's Astronomy in Hampton. <laughs> <laughs> great <laughs> deals. <laughs> great, great deals. No, <laughs> not, he's a little hard to deal with, but he's, yeah, he's a good seller. <laughs> All right, let's go to our Rosanna's Fun Facts maybe next, guys. All uh, right, Paul, well, if you're ready to go. All right, let me just get this all set up here first off. All right. I'll put that over here, and uh, can 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 I can I just pin myself maybe? I can pin you. Well, if you pin yourself, uh, it might not show up. You can try it. Okay. Try to pin You're yourself. Tired. Okay. But it pins you, but I don't see you pinned. Okay. So I have to. Okay. Right. You could... You're presenting <laughs> anyway. Okay. All right. So let me just uh, now you're pinned. Am I pinned now? now? I just oh, let me get that thing hidden, and I just gotta find this. There we go. There you go. And this is this week's Rosanna's fun fact. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Welcome hey. back, Anna, for another fun fact week full of fun facts. And uh, so th this is kind of an interesting one. Um, Question mark, who, uh, who talk, we talked earlier about and to. Question mark. Um, was talking. So, why well, we're not to <laughs> so, I'll have to mute my mic. Sorry, I'm going to start laughing here. Question mark. <laughs> However, okay, so he was talking about sound and space and all that kind of stuff. Well, that's really what this week's uh, Rosanna's Fun Facts is all about. So, let's get started. So, let's see if I can make that larger. There we go. They say no one can hear you scream in space. I wonder, is that true? Ah, gosh darn it, Mitch, turn off the radio before you do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that's funny. Anyway, um, so Rosanna writes this week, she says, the summer, this summer my granddaughter received her summer issue of Kazoo, a really fun magazine. There was a super article on the songs of outer space which has led to all sorts of wonderful fun facts. The songs of outer space does not mean songs about space. That's a quick Google for YouTube playlist, but it's about the actual sounds made in space. For a long time, it's been said that there is no sound in space, which was true, sort of, to a point. First, a little background on sound. According to a Forbes article in 2017, conventional sound requires a medium to travel through, and it's created when particles compress and rarefy, making anything from a loud bang for a small single pulse to a consistent tone for repeating patterns. In space, where there are so few particles that any such signals die away, <clears throat> excuse me, even solar flares, supernova, black hole mergers, and other cosmic catastrophes go silent before they're ever heard. That may make one think about, does a tree falling make a sound? Okay, I've got my thing hidden. A sec. <laughs> uh, we'll do it this way, I guess. There we are. <clears throat> so, uh, however, on September 14th, 2015, all that changed. Gravitational waves were discovered, and that meant that there was now a medium of sorts for particles to travel through. Thanks to the first positive detection results from LIGO, we are we're hearing the universe for the very first time. So chirp, that is the sound that two black holes make when they collide in space. Um, it doesn't sound quite like the chirp described in Jaden's magazine, but like poetic license, I guess it's open to interpretation. This led me to, um, the book, uh, to get the book Black Hole Blues and other songs from outer space by Jan Levin, PhD and professor of physics at astronomy at, at Barnard College in Columbia University. I just got it this week, so more about that in a future fact. So meanwhile, another fun fact, 1.3, the number of years ago in billions, that those two black holes were that were only just very collided. 
The chirping has been ringing out for a very long time. Another number, 2.5 is the length of miles of each of the arms of the laser inframometer, gravitational wave observatory, LIGO, amplifiers to detect space sounds. So the amplifiers are so sensitive that, that if they were measuring the distance to the nearest star, they would be accurate down to the width of a hair. Now, just for those who don't know how big a hair is, a hair width is, is between 17 and 180 micrometers, just in case anybody's curious. So on September 2nd, 2020, LIGO released a new article stating that the sound of two black holes merging is more like a bang. Now, don't get too excited. I can only find um, a numerical video of two black holes merging still, but no sound. So I'm not going to play that video. According to Kazoo, who <laughs> or woo is the sound that a star makes when it explodes. So on the search for the woo, um, I discovered this amazing video, and I'm going to play it for you. And you're going to get to hear the woo and the, at the end of the chirp. I'm going to play it for you now. And I'm going to go right to where it starts. I'm not going to play the whole video. I'm just going to play to where you hear it, start to hear it. And then I'm going to turn up the sound so all you folks out there can hear it. That's it. <laughs> the end, told the scientists that the stars had merged. That's, that's what it sounded like. Isn't that something? Wow. <laughs> now, uh, having said all of that, let me see if I can get back to my picture. Oh, where'd it go? Maybe I'll do it this way. There we go. Um, <clears throat> uh, so considering the fact, whoops, sorry about that. There we go. I love, this, I love this picture. So considering the fact that there are at least one billion black holes in our galaxy, space could, in theory, be a really noisy place with a woo-wops of chirping overlapping. But since collisions are actually very rare, happening only about once every 500 million years, it is still, relatively speaking, a quiet place. <laughs> Yeah, I love that. And that is this week's. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> the Journal Fun Fact. Awesome. Hey. Oh, thank you very much, Rosanna. That's just awesome. fantastic. We just love that stuff. There we go. You can unpay me, Chris. And... Yeah. Do you want to stop presenting? Uh, sure. Okay. There we Fair. go. Perfect. There, so to, uh, to Mark with the question <laughs> and sound that goes on out there and how far you can actually hear and how far back you can actually hear. Thanks, Paul. That's awesome. And thank yeah. you, Rosanna, for that as well. Really, well. really enjoy those. Okay, so next up, uh, we're at about 8.44, guys. So we've got time, I guess, for one more item each, maybe. Sure. Um, okay, so Mike, did you want to? Start sure. our, second, our second round here. Okay, let's take a look for questions first of all. Are there any questions? I've been watching the uh, the live feeds here. Uh, <laughs> Black hole blues. There we go. <laughs> Mike's going back to the seventies when he had long hair. Oh yeah. Geez. Trudy said that that sound just freaked out the dog. <laughs> Sorry, Trudy. <laughs> 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 All right, Mike. Let's uh, let's see what you got to offer for the second item. I'll ping round you. two. Item What's next item up, and the price is right. <laughs> is it round two? Item four. Again, I wanted something with dual purpose, not just that I can use for astronomy, but I can use for other things. And it came out to be uh, the original astronaut space pen. Oh wow. Well. Now, we've all heard the story where the Americans spent $20 million perfecting the perfect space pen. They would write in all directions, upside down, underwater, high heat, low heat, and the Russians used a pencil. That is not true. <laughs> <laughs> when it came to the Fisher space pen, it was Mr. Fisher alone who decided he was going to take it on his own to design a, a, a pen for space, believe it or not. And he designed it, Fisher from Fisher Pens. And it's been used ever since. I got a little video I want to play for you, and then I'll show you the 
the space pen. If I could just pull this up, I found this quite interesting. Uh, entire screen, this guy, share. And I'll uh, start this up as soon as it comes up here. And I hope you hear it because uh, I've, I've tried the volume here. Here we go. And finally tonight here, Made in America. The pens made right here outside Mike, Los we're not seeing the video. We have one. We're not seeing the video? No. What do you see? Like I'm seeing it. You are seeing it? I got you yeah. pinned right now. Okay, try again. Right here, oh, there. America. Okay, got you now. Good. Right here outside Las Vegas, and I finally have one. I can tell you, they're out in this world. Liftoff. We have liftoff. October 10th, 1968. Apollo 7 off to a good start. Apollo 7 taking flight. On board, three American astronauts and one brand new American invention. Right there in astronaut Walt Cunningham's hands, a Fisher space bed. And one year later, one small step for man. as man stepped on the moon, they used a Fisher space bed to document the discovery. All right, you have to come to Nevada to see the famous Fisher space pen. That's right. So you brought one. Yes. yes. What do you got? This is the original astronaut space pen used on all manned space flights. He even has uh, little Oh, yeah. On. Look at that. My own Fisher space pen. Right. My name right there on it. And 50 years later, a sense of pride tonight. So this went up with Apollo 7. Yes. Yeah. This marks 50 years in space for us. It was Carrie's dad, Paul Fisher, who invented the pen in 1966. He was already in the ballpoint pen business, but was convinced he could do better. The original pens were just lousy. They loosed out the front, they dry it up, you could, pet, you could transfer a signature to two weeks later with the thumbprint. So they were just off. I mean, you can still do that today with pens. And they're still kind of a mess. Um, Not yours, though. That's right. <laughs> Paul Fisher invented his patented pressurized ink cartridge using <laughs> nitrogen, sealing the ink. It doesn't rely on gravity to bring the ink down to right. They tested it to 50 below zero, 400 degrees above. So it works. <laughs> <laughs> you can see right here, all the things in Nevada, USA. 35 outside Las Vegas and 65 workers, making up 3,000 pins a day. Love. First, the stainless steel cut into these pen tips. Each batch checked under a microscope before being cleaned and sent here, where they're attached to Fisher's patented pressurized ink cartridge. Then over to assembly, each one by hand. Tara Woolman on the line for 21 years. This is not a family dinner. Proudly holding up one of her newly completed pen tips then picked up by Oswaldo for packaging, a new hire. And it turns out all those years ago, they had donated a few hundred pens to the Russians for the cosmonaut, a goodwill gesture. The Russians still use the pen, so they're paying for it now though, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking out for Made in America. I want to make sure you're making money out these things. A 50-year-old Made in America idea, still selling more than a million pens around the world every year. So there you go. That's wow. Uh, Awesome. Fisher space pen. <laughs> so, Mike, I have to ask, what's what's the Fisher price? <laughs> the Fisher price. He, as Chris, <laughs> wah, wah. He, asked, he asked me earlier today, did you buy the seven hundred dollar pen? And I said, no, I did not. So the price does get up there, but the average uh, good real Fisher space pen will sell for around sixty dollars. And yeah. guess what? You can take it out, and even if there's dew on your paper, this pen will write, so you can keep your logs at night out doing astronomy. It's an amazing, amazing little pen to have. So if you're looking for a, a gift for the astronomer that's not an astronomy toy, so to speak, why not get them the Fisher, official Fisher space pen that's been going to space since the 1960s, even with all the shuttle launches. This pen has been going up with all the crews. So there you go. That's the uh, official astronaut space pen. <laughs> so, so where do you get them? Again, uh, they can be found on Amazon. They can be found on eBay. I haven't seen a local store here with them, but you can uh, go online and buy them direct from Fisher if you like, and they'll have them sent right to your door. But uh, and I have. I've you know gone out with with wet paper and everything else, and this thing will actually write on it. It's pretty That's cool. Amazing. So. Wow. Yeah, What's that? Is yours engraved? Mine's not engraved because I, I got it for me. Yeah. <laughs> but
Like but you that. could have a grave for someone, not maybe not from them, but so you could probably get that done. Before. Well, they'll do it for you if you you know you can go on their site and you can get, uh, you can add any little different option you want. But as you do, the price goes up. Like I said, it can get up to seven hundred bucks for their fancy fancy one. But yeah, I thought it was pretty cool that they donated uh, three hundred plus to the Russians for their space program, and they, they still use them today. They're on the International Space Station. That's fantastic. So, yeah. Awesome. Great. Good stuff. Thanks, Mike. Space pen. Everybody's going to have one. The same one as, uh, I don't know if they had that in Seinfeld. Was that the one they had in Seinfeld or not? I can't remember. But I know they did have one in Seinfeld, and Jerry kept the space pen from the guy. Remember? Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> so, yeah. Sure. What's, what's the exact name Mary's asking? F-I-S-H-E-R? F-I-S-H-E-R. There space you go. Yeah. There you go, Mary. Make sure you dot the I with a red dot. Rita says... <laughs> <laughs> Rita says I did get my brother a space pen years ago. Cool, Rita. Nice. Oh, nice. Novel gift idea, Stefan says. Yeah, that's true. Okay, uh, Paul. Um, Rita says awesome hats. Well, thanks, Rita. <laughs> this one's starting to cut. This one is starting to cut the circulation off on the top of my head. So if I pass out here, guys, when we're stroke or something, you'll know what happened. <laughs> 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 Oh, this is just week week one of maybe four weeks of this stuff, so you better be prepared for next week. <laughs> okay, I'm going to show okay. you a couple. Speaking of uh, speaking of pens, okay. I'm going to just show you a, a couple of uh, simple things that you can buy, and you don't have to go to an astronomy store to buy these. That's the nice thing about this stuff. Now, Mike is he's influenced Chris and I so much that when we think astronomy, we think of uh, Prince's Auto or Canadian Tire or any of those places because that's where we go to figure out what are we going to buy ourselves for, for that, that would do astronomy stuff. Everything from cases to lights or whatever. So here's the light, first of all, that everybody should have if you're an astronomer. Now, number one is if you're going to go to a dark sky site, you're going to want to be able to see where you're going. So this light here is just a little LED flashlight. Gives you the white light so you can see where you're going. Once you get there, you don't, and when your eye dark eyes, when your eyes dark adapt, we don't want to lose that dark eye adaption. So if you use that white light, your pupils are going to dilate, and it's going to take a little while for them to open up again. So in order to stay to keep your eyes from not doing that, it's got a little red light, and red light is acceptable for the for us to have a peek, so that when we're looking at our star charts, when we're plugging things in, if we want to change eye pieces, that kind of stuff. If you do it with a red light, it's not going to affect your dark eye adaption. Now you can buy these at Canadian Tire, you can buy them at um, um, Princess Auto, you can buy them up at, uh, what's that place, uh, Home Depot, all that. Typically these go on average for between say 14, 15 bucks, something like that, something along those lines. And all they do is that once the batteries die out in them, when they are LED and they last a long time, uh, they're just basically AAA batteries. You just unscrew the thing, it pulls out and there's three little AAA batteries in there, throw them back in and you're good to go. It fits in your pocket, so it's an easy carry uh, and that sort of thing. So that's one light and just keeping on the light um, topic, you can buy what the, they call uh, police lights, which are the same thing. You can see other things, I won't tell you what they are. Well, actually the package does. So you can see automotive leaks, urine, blood, scorpions. <laughs> <laughs> And you're out in the middle of the night thinking that you're Joe Pesci and you're looking for dead bodies and you're looking for stuff, but you don't want to get bit by a scorpion. This is your light. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, this light does, uh, does again, it, it does have the red light and it's got a variety of different um, uh, levels that you can use with it. This one's a little more powerful, but again, depending on where you're going and, and uh, it's because when you have, when you go to dark sky sites, Sometimes you got to walk through areas that you really need to be able to see where you're going. And I bought this one on sale at Canadian Tire for I think it was twelve or fourteen dollars. And they're normally these ones are normally around forty. So uh, so another great light that'll give you white light so you can see where you're going, and red light so you can keep your dark eye adaption. Great Christmas gifts. Get them anywhere, and you don't have to order them from a quantity store. Awesome, That's Paul. Fun. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, okay, let's unpin you there. Bring us all back Great together. You, you spread some light on that situation. Yes, I'm glad I could shed some light. Wow. <laughs> oh, the longer the show goes on, the worse it gets. 
<laughs> I like to call it comedy hour, but I don't know if I can call that comedy or not. I'll have to let other people respond. Okay, well, I guess a talk about astronomy, stargazing, can't uh, go on without something like this, this book called Night Watch. I guess we've all had this uh, in the past. We've all kind of started out with this book. It's kind of like our beginning book. Anybody that wants to get started in astronomy, this is usually the book that we, uh, we suggest to get started with. Uh, so it's called Night Watch by Terence Dickinson, Practical Guide to Viewing the Universe. This one is actually the revised fourth edition, updated for use through 2025. There we go. Paul's got it too. <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, I'm not sure what edition. This, this, is, this is the third edition. Third edition, okay. So yeah. this is the fourth edition. Um, anyway, through the book, uh, there's so much information here that it's really hard to absorb. If you want something to sit down and, and uh, look through for uh, a few nights at least on a cloudy night or whatever, a nice rainy night, here's a nice chart of the Milky Way itself showing... Um, the information uh, where things are located in the Milky Way, where we're, where we're located, starts out with that, basically. Uh, gives the whole story of, of the universe. Not the whole story, I guess the story's still going on, but uh, it does talk a bit about backyard astronomy, uh, what to purchase for a telescope, what to purchase for binoculars, uh, that type of thing. The thing I do like about this probably the most is when you get into oh, about a third of the way through the book, you start getting into star maps. So there's a star map for the summertime sky. Of course, our summertime sky in our lifetime is not going to change. Um, these we, we takes, It takes us 250 million years to go around the galaxy once, so we're probably not going to have to worry about any change in, in, uh, in star locations from year to year. But uh, this is the summertime sky, and here, uh, this is for the northern hemisphere. So down at the bottom, we've got Sagittarius, Scorpius, um, that one there, whatever that one there is, Vega, Deneb, and Altair. Uh, I don't know, Summer Triangle? Yeah. <laughs> something there calls a C sig sig siginess siginess the the joke is that the joke is that when Paul is shooting uh, astrophotography shots, he's always in the Cygnus, shooting Cygnus. So I ask him, is there anything else that you can shoot? No, 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 no. <laughs> so <many Cygnus. laughs> we know there's an area between Leo and Virgo that they call the realm of the galaxies. Thousands, tens of thousands of galaxies in there. Probably get three or four in your eyepiece. No, no, no. Cygnus. <laughs> so I'm trying to introduce Paul to other things in our sky. So there's the summertime sky. But, you know, Paul, we actually have an autumn sky, too, and a winter sky. So we have the same thing offered uh, with those. Um, here on the on about halfway through the book, we've got a spring, summer, uh, autumn, and winter uh, layout here. And then it breaks them down into small uh, pieces. So if you're looking at the spring sky, you know, if you look at chart number nine, chart number nine is over here, actually on the summertime sky, flip over to chart number nine and there's the layout. And the great thing about this is if you have a red flashlight, all of this stuff glows really nicely, especially the, uh, the information here, um, of where they're located, how far away they are, the magnitude, that kind of thing. So it's a great book for learning the night sky. And the good thing about this too is that it's spiral bound. Look for the spiral bound edition because it lays nice and flat like that. Uh, take a piece of plastic, put over the top of it to protect it from dew a bit, if you can, um, and flip through your pages to your to your leisure. Even at the back of the book, it has the, the southern uh, constellations. So if you happen to be in the southern hemisphere, where it's nice and warm right now, uh, you can take the book with you and travel down to Australia and take a look at their sky. Uh, all kinds of information, lots about comets, lots about uh, telescopes, binoculars, what to choose, what to look for, even information on our closest star, the sun. So, and how to how to view the sun safely, that kind of thing. So, awesome, an awesome book. Uh, they run about thirty-five dollars, I guess now uh, at Indigo or Chapters. Uh, you can get them on Amazon as well, of course. Um, but I would rec highly recommend that book for any beginner. <laughs> hey, do I have to turn your cameras off? Turn in. <laughs> <laughs> had to happen. Had to happen. Anyway, that's uh, that's a great book. It's called Night Watch by Terence Dickinson. This one is the revised fourth edition, good till 2025. So uh, keep an eye out for that one. Uh, it's a nice uh, Christmas present and something that you'll all, you'll go back and refer to quite often when you're getting started in the hobby. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for that, guys.
always appreciate that little bit of uh, humor along when I'm trying to do a serious talk. <laughs> well, listen, we would do uh, a Mary Venus. <laughs> those two words don't go together. <laughs> okay, any final comments here uh, from anybody out there uh, before we sign off for the evening? Just taking a look at, uh, so if you do have uh, questions about um, items that you've seen tonight, let us know. Uh, we can give you information uh, on where to find them, and uh, I guess you probably uh, found out what we think about the objects that we've looked at. Uh, we're all the ones that we that we have shown here tonight are something that we would all purchase or all have purchased in the past, right? Uh, all of us, I guess. Is, um, <laughs> it's impossible not to smell. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. Appreciate that. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, Mary says she's too. She has the book, eh? Mary has it? it? Yeah, oh, just okay. before. Yeah, Nightwatch book's so great. The charts, maps are wonderful, often found at yard sales for pennies. Well, okay. <laughs> That's a good deal. Uh, the thing about now, too, like, if you're considering stuff for Christmas, um, and these items are things that were that you were, that you're looking. At. That's why we want to get started early. Was because we know that a lot of the stores are selling out very quickly. Um, with the pandemic, a lot of people are home now. They're looking for hobbies. They're looking for things to to occupy their time. A lot more people are are stargazing. They're looking up a lot more often. We're getting I get tons of comments and tons of messages, like tons of them about you know what to purchase, how to get started, all that kind of thing. And we've done a number of shows on that before. We might end up doing another. Uh, beginners course uh, coming up in a little bit but the idea is that if you look at these shows I and mean, the reason why we're doing these shows for the next few weeks is to get people uh, looking at these items and ordering them quickly because they're going to sell out a lot of them uh, a lot of the telescope stores right now are sold out of most of their telescopes like their their standard sizes their six or eight inch daubs uh, their four and a half inch you know tabletops like I'm going to show here next week um, that type of thing they're selling out very quickly and their prices are climbing like Mike says you know they're blaming it on COVID uh, but I think it's what it is, is that the uh, the suppliers are, are, they're not having all their employees in, in the office working in the warehouses all the time now. So uh, getting their shipments out the door takes longer to get their shipments out. And because more people are interested in astronomy and stargazing, of course, the demand goes up, so the price goes up. So uh, keep an eye on that. So order these items as quickly as you can, and so you'll have them uh, in for your Christmas morning. Uh, you won't have uh, disappointment. Uh, along the way. Okay, so then uh, I guess in closing tonight, uh, again, uh, our special thanks uh, once again for your continued support. We hope you enjoyed tonight's material uh, and we'll be continuing with the topic of what to purchase for Christmas again next week. We'll have some more ideas for you next week and probably for a couple of weeks leading up till probably the 1st of December. Uh, actually, I think next week is our anniversary, our one-year anniversary, guys. It is. It so is. Do an anniversary one show. For one year. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, one year wow. next week. <laughs> Have we come a long way, or are we still as uh, goofy as we've been? I think probably yeah, that part is that's, 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 that's not going to change. <laughs> I think our goofiness is maturing. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> well, we'll have to ask the audience that part. <laughs> we'll see how many. You no, know, look, look, just dropped off three or four people. Oh well. Uh, thanks again, of course, to Rosanna for her continued contributions to our show. We really appreciate it. Um, and remember, too, we do love getting your photos. Uh, we didn't get any photos this week, so you can send them, though, to Sunday Night Astronomy Show at gmail.com or put them on my Facebook page, send them in as a, as a visitor post, and we'd be happy to uh, share them and include them on our next broadcast for sure. Uh, we also uh, are looking for suggestions for topics for future shows. If you have anything that you would like us to discuss on a future episode, please send your request to the same address, Sunday Night Astronomy Show at gmail.com, and we'll do our best to make it happen for you. We also ask that if you enjoyed uh, the content and you joined us from YouTube, please consider giving us a like and a subscribing to our channel. And please uh, let your family and friends know, too, that we are here every Sunday night at the same time to uh, help educate and entertain you on the night sky. Uh, so for now, then, from Mike, Paul, and I, uh, stay safe, everybody out there. We wish you all clear skies. Get those Christmas orders in. And we hope to see you again here next week. And remember, as we like to say here, guys, keep your scopes pointed up. Point it up. Have a great week, everybody. Good night. That everybody, big hands. Woo! Big hands. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>